Hello, and welcome to a slightly delayed special Cybersecurity Awareness Month LinkedIn Live. After a few technical difficulties this morning, we are live online here with you today. And today's discussion is brought to you by Optin, the Cyber Advisory and Solutions Leader. I'm Carl Fishkin. I'll be your host today, and I'm Vice President with Optive Services Organization, focused on digital transformation and data protection. To get us started, I want to first offer up, please engage with us throughout this conversation, participate with us, use the chat at the bottom of your screen to drop any and all questions or thoughts, and we would do our, we'll do our best to get to them in real time or at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. So here we are. Max, Lisa, we're celebrating 20 years of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and while staying secure may feel more daunting than ever, we're hopeful that we can throw a nod to where we've been, where we are, and where we're going to help organizations and individuals alike realize all is not lost, that they can, in fact, remain resilient in the face of cyber threats. So here with me to discuss these topics is Max Shire and Lisa Plagemeyer. Max is Optus Chief Information Security Officer. He's a retired Air Force veteran, seasoned security and counterintelligence leader, and leads Optus cybersecurity strategy and program implementation. Lisa is the Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance and a security awareness and education leader with a proven track record of engaging and empowering businesses and their employees to protect themselves and their data. So I'm really excited about this topic today. We're gonna to cover some of the basics to good cybersecurity practices, but we're gonna do it through a modern lens. We're gonna cover everything from passwords, multi-factor authentication, software updating, patching, and of course, no good LinkedIn Live today can go without talking about artificial intelligence. So we're gonna to touch on that as well. So let's get started. So let me start with first with uh, something simple. It's changed dramatically in the last 20 years, passwords. The memes about special characters and numbers and letters and uppercase and lowercase are endless. Tells me maybe the general population as a whole still doesn't understand the importance of strong passwords and password managers. So Lisa, let's start with you. Is season year still a thing? I, I think we have to be honest, passwords have been a complete failure. <laughs> the faster we can get to <laughs> passwordless, I think the happier most people will be. Um, I've been giving talks to organizations all month long, and that'll continue even until the through the first week of November. And we poll their employees, we poll the audience, and we compare them to some data that we have from the general public from a, a re report we just published lately with that surveyed 6,000 people. Um, only about a third of people say they use really unique passwords all the time. Um, so that's really problematic. And then we're big fans of password managers, but because of some of the headlines uh, over the past year or two, most people um, don't trust those solutions. Uh, we find that adoption by organizations is really slow. So people are more likely to, to use a password manager for their family than they are for, um, for work because their organization hasn't adopted one for corporate use. What we like to see are organizations that um, not don't just have one for corporate use, but then have licensed it in a way that those employees can also use it for home use. Um, I can speak from experience that when you have more than one password manager installed on your browser, they all fight with each other and you, <laughs> you don't want that. It makes life painful. Um, and, and some of the questions that I get from audiences as I speak this month are about passwords are really interesting. People using um, you know, still thinking that if they change a few characters, they have that core password, right? And we think about, you know, a couple of years ago, we could choose whatever we wanted to be our password. And that's just not the case anymore, right? The complexity length and complexity rules got harder and harder to uh, comply with. So what happened? We thought of something that uppercase, lowercase, special characters, all those things It met all those rules. Um, and then we kind of fall in love with it. And so we start using it all over the place. And so a lot of people have developed this habit of just changing a few characters and thinking that that's going to fit the bill and that's somehow magically going to keep cyber criminals away. And of course, once you explain to them that they're up against software, they're not up against a human, they're up against a human enabled with technology, then I think the light bulb starts to starts to go on and people say, well, but I use I use um, things that aren't my, you know, things that aren't true, or I use hints that aren't true or what have you. And it's really not about that. It's about how long is that password and how fast can it be cracked? And um, so it's, it's, it's a very popular topic this October, for sure. Um, 
and we also stress, of course, no password is enough. It takes multi-factor authentication, right, to have a best practice. Yeah, and Lisa, I think you, you made some great points there. And I think, honestly, to your point, passwords are an archaic method of protecting our accounts, right? And we need to move beyond that. And you mentioned MFA, but I think, you know, from a password perspective, I think we, we as organizations do need to start adopting password managers and password vaults, et cetera, as an additional layer of defense for those accounts that we do have passwords for. I mean, obviously, passwordless is the future, and we need to move in that direction. And uh, it seems as though organizations are slow to adopt, right? And I think, you know, Optiv obviously is pushing for passwordless authentication as well. And, and even within Optiv, you know, we're looking at that as something for implementation. And I think it's, it is the wave of the future and we have to get there, not just from a, um, from a security perspective, but also an end user perspective, right? It just makes it great for, uh, great for, for the end user experience. But I think from a, password manager perspective, we do need to start looking at those as, you know, something that can be secure if you use the right product. Um, open source, you know, probably not the best method of, of protecting your passwords. But to your point, browsers, not a great way to protect your passwords either. And um, so we need to use the right products uh, for password management. But MFA obviously is something that if you have the capability to implement, you need to move in that direction. And, and that's something that, um, we need to move. We mean we need to move towards. So Max, perfect segue uh, to my my next question about MFA. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly right. It's it's been prominent at the organizational level for years, uh, but now we're seeing it in exactly. a lot of products and services at the individual level, such as a banking app where you have mm -hmm. to put code into your you know that's been emailed or texted to you, which has its own security risks. Um, so you know, can you touch a little bit on what we're seeing in the marketplace and and Talk a little bit about what's on the horizon. Yeah, well, I mean, MFA is, is we have to implement that. Um, passwords have been a failure to Lisa's point. And MFA, as you look across even all of your social media accounts, is something that is now being pushed as an alternate, or excuse me, an additional layer of security. And we, I, I've enabled it on almost every single account that I can, whether it be banking, social media, et cetera. And, um, you know, and I think, the additional methods are not um, overbearing, right? Either you enter a number or, you know, if you have a push notification, you, you hit accept, or um, it's something that I don't think is uh, too much for the end user to, to utilize. Um, but to your point, the future is passwordless. And when you get to passwordless authentication, it's just one of those things that it's just, it's frictionless, right? And I think that's the key word to passwordless is frictionless. And um, MFA is great. And, you need to enable it across the board wherever you can. And it's one of those things that I think organizationally uh, with, with corporations or otherwise, it's something that we've been utilizing for years. And, you know, it started off with a hardware token or a YubiKey or something similar. It was something you had. And, uh, and now it's moved to, um, you know, applications or other software-based uh, authentication me mechanisms. And, um, and so, you know, to your point, we've been using this for years and it just makes sense because we know it works to implement on the commercial side as well. Um, but, you know, we're finding that through social engineering, obviously you can also circumvent MFA as well. So it's not a foolproof method. I, I don't think anything is going to be a foolproof method if there's, if there's ways to reset authentication mechanisms. Um, and we're finding that in recent, you know, attacks across the board, um, specifically with the most recent uh, high visibility attacks. But if you can implement MFA, you have to. It, it just makes sense. Passwords are not a great method to protect your account. And, you know, to Lisa's point, it's just one of those things where I think we need to move to the next level of security and implement that additional layer if you can. Yeah, no, and, and Max, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned the frictionless. It's so important. What, what we see, we see it with our clients as well, is that users will find the the easiest path like water right? right they'll find that easiest path and even mfa they find ways to make it as easy as possible and 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 of course that you know with social engineering and other methods even mfa is not foolproof lisa what yeah. do you see on the consumer side well i think that um most people don't realize we were talking about password managers earlier when i look at how fast the password manager can populate my credentials and then how quickly, if I'm using facial recognition with a push notification to, to an authenticator on my phone, um, that combination 
is probably faster and less friction than me actually typing my username and password. I mean, it is incredibly, incredibly convenient. So I think more and more consumers are realizing that MFA doesn't have to be painful. I think when it was a new thing and we left our phone out in our car and we want to sign into our bank account, you kind of go get your phone. And there was, I think we're getting a lot fewer eye rolls than we did when it was a, a brand new solution. Um, the good news is that 70% um, of people know what it is. Um, most of them have used it at least once. And my favorite stat of, of, of all in our new research was that 94% of people, if they've started using MFA, they're still using it. So we kind of get over that initial um, frustration with having that additional layer or friction. But, um, but by and large, we're creatures of habit. So once we've enabled it, chances are we're not going to disable it. Um, I, I also think that it's really important for organizations to, to realize that there's a lot more consumer acceptance and even consumer expectation of it at this point. Um, Salesforce recently mandated it for all their users, which was not an easy task. So if you're an organization that isn't mandating it, much less, you know, or offering it, then I think you really need to um, need to rethink that. Um, there's actually a website out there. Uh, with, I think it's some software developers or application um, security specialists who are naming and shaming. They're keeping a website of organizations that don't offer it, don't mandate it, and organizations that don't offer it. Um, and there are some biggies on that list. You'd be surprised. So we're going to try and tell some more stories this year as a nonprofit about the success stories for organizations who are thinking about mandating it, um, that it can be done. It takes some customer communications. And um, I don't think you're introducing as, as necessarily as much friction as, as you think you might be or, or will have as much, um, you know, consumer frustration than you might have gotten a couple of years ago if you were making that move. Lisa, do you see from a consumer standpoint, you know, company standpoint, do you see MFA migrating to the next level to password list or whatever it might be anytime soon? Or or are we kind of going to be in for MFA for a little while now as people get more used to it and, and it gets smoother? I think we're going to be, um, I mean, look, even some versions of, if you look at what, for example, what Google is doing, even some versions of being passwordless um, have an element of MFA every once in a while that pops up to make mm -hmm. sure that you're you, right? Um, so there's still there's still little bits and pieces of authentication that happen that where there, you know, there's some interaction with the consumer, even in organizations that are moving really quickly towards being um, passwordless. Um, I think not, you know, what I tell consumers, you know, a lot of people use this excuse of, oh, we're not going to have passwords too much longer. Everybody's moving to a passwordless future. So therefore I can continue my bad habits. And that's the last thing that I want to see happen is a lot of people with, you know, using the same password on multiple websites, using a password that's, you know, maybe even six, as short as six or seven or eight characters. Um, that those really aren't good things. So what I what we tell people is that not everybody's going to get there at the same speed. Yes, your employer might get there, might have an easier time imp implementing zero trust with inside the organization than a consumer facing application that you use. Um, not everybody's going to get there at the same time. So passwords and MFA are going to be with us for a little bit longer. So um, not an excuse to have bad habits. Wonderful. Well, th thank you for that, uh, Max and, and Lisa. So, you know, we've, we've talked, it's MFA really essential and that, that that extra layer can be the difference between a bad actor giving up or, or pushing on. Um, so let's pivot to another essential cybersecurity practice. Um, and, and that is uh, software updates, right? Uh, we've seen significant changes on how software updates are pushed to consumers, but there are still challenges. Um, Lisa, maybe we'll start with you. Can you talk a little bit about how software updates have evolved over the past 20 years and how users should approach them? Well, I think one of the things that I've noticed recently just as a consumer is things like my antivirus don't require a complete shutdown anymore, a restart of my machine, which is super, super handy. So I think a lot of us got in that habit of clicking remind me later because we thought this is going to interrupt something really critical that I'm working on and I'm, you know, I'm in the zone. I don't want to stop what I'm doing. I don't want to have to restart my machine. Um, 
interesting information about the, you know, if you've read what's been published lately about the LastPass breach and how one of their engineers was breached through, I think it was a, an unpatched streaming app at home, um, which to me, I mean, we all know that since COVID, there's been this gray area between work and home, but that that took it to a whole new level. Um, I think most consumers, because their employer is are, are pushing patches to them at work, and they're largely behind the scenes. They don't ha have to do, you know, we're not requiring the employee to do anything. That it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. But then people don't pivot and realize when I'm, you know, that the stuff that I've brought into my home, my IoT devices, my my um, router, the different apps that I use in my home. But those need maintenance. You know, I tell people it's like cutting the grass. You can't just ignore it. It's got to it's got to get maintained. Um, and I think most people think it is kind of set it and forget it. And that last pass story for me just really brought it home on on why we can't even let a streaming app at home um, go unpatched. Um, almost two thirds of people have turned on automatic updates, um, but that's mainly for their for their devices not necessarily every app that they use, like streaming apps. Um, and so we're just not seeing the adoption we'd like to see from people in their in their personal lives. So I think it's really changed in the work world. It's happening behind the scenes. Um, we also never turn off our devices anymore. <laughs> Who powers down their phone or their laptop or anything else on a regular basis? It doesn't happen, um, especially if we're not in an office. We don't power down and put our laptop in our backpack and go home you know i go from my den to my living room and that's it so um also missing an opportunity for things to update because we're not we're not signing off of accounts enough and we're not we're not shutting things down frequently enough right so max software updates in the corporate world have been around for a while and there's been lots of tools in microsoft and others that are out there how, how does it play in the in, in in the corporate world as we go forward yeah, well, I mean, vulnerability management is just one of those um, baseline cybersecurity hygiene items that I think, you know, we know it's there, we focus on it, but it's also probably one of the first thing that drops off if we get busy, right? And uh, a vulnerability management program, because I look at it as a program versus a task, it's an ongoing recurring uh, thing that you have to do, you have to stay on top of it. Um, you know, it's, it's, as Lisa mentioned, you have to keep cutting the grass, otherwise it's gonna get significantly long. And, uh, and it also opens you up for vulnerabilities. I mean, the, the risk there of not patching is way too great. And I think, you know, the, the threat landscape is always gonna focus on exploits, right? We have social engineering there and that's there because they can't find either a technical way to get in or something of that sort, you're, you're, you have a good patching hygiene. And I think we need to stay on top of that. Otherwise you make yourself an easy target and you don't want that. Um, you know, I think over the past year, uh, organizations across the board have seen a significant uptick in activity, um, whether it be large activity scans, um, uh, you know, pointed attacks against their networks, et cetera, trying to find vulnerabilities and exploits. Um, you know, I think across several verticals, you see that and patching is one of those baseline cybersecurity hygiene items that's going to keep you at a lower risk, make you a hard target versus an easy target. And again, it's it's, you know, it's one of those basic things that you need to stay on top of. Um, and to Lisa's point, I just like to piggyback off of off of her comments. I think, you know, a lot of people do forget about their home routers and, you know, some of those firmware updates in addition to their software updates that, you know, you, it's sitting in your home closet or it's sitting something out of sight, out of mind, and you, you just completely forget about it. Um, but there's been several uh, high visibility uh, vulnerabilities that have been released recently regarding routers. And, you know, it's one of those things that you do have to keep up to date. Uh, otherwise, again, you know, you, you're working from home. And to Lisa's point, uh, your home network is now your work network, essentially, right? Even with our zero trust network access tools and everything else, you're still writing on your home network. And that's something that we need to consider. We need to move all of those organizational security practices that we have at our companies and move them to our home networks now, um, because we're now targets at our home. And, uh, and so we need to make sure that we stay on top of that. And I was gonna say too, Patching, uh, it's its more than just installing software. Vulnerability management is more than just installing software. It's also misconfigurations and software, et cetera. And that's something else that we need to be evaluating as we look at patching and, and looking at vulnerability management as a whole. 
we need to be scanning for misconfigurations on the network as well and take that into consideration because that it combined with uh, an absence of a patch or something like that could be a, a very critical uh, security vulnerability. So patching is more than just installing software. I look at it as vulnerability management. We need to look at those misconfigurations as well from an organizational perspective, because I think that in a lot of ways is maybe not looked at as hard as what we should um, when you're looking at your vulnerability management program. So, so Max, you know, most organizations have some type of security executive like yourself, uh, who's, mm -hmm. who's there every day, wakes up every morning thinking about how to protect the enterprise. How do you, and what would you recommend to get users to be more proactive in this and, and make sure that they're doing the patching or the updates or, or, mm -hmm. or, or taking care of their home networks? What are some of the things that you do? Yeah, security awareness is always top of mind. And, um, you know, from a consumer perspective, making it easy for them to update, automatic updates, et cetera, is, is a great way. But in a lot of ways, a lot of those updates still require user intervention uh, to make sure that they install it, reboot their system to Lisa's point, et cetera. Um, and a lot of that is just user awareness. And, uh, you know, we as employees of our of our companies may understand all of this, but maybe our family members don't. I know my kids don't. They never reboot their systems. They never restart their phones. And in fact, they could care less about security updates. And I have to, you know, on a monthly basis, I'll go around to every device in the house and make sure that we're up to date. Right. And uh, and I hate to say it, but my wife is probably the worst out of all of us. <laughs> And so I have to make sure that, um, you know, I do my due diligence and, and be proactive when it comes to the family's devices. Um, you know, and, and my home router is also one of those that I make sure I log into on a regular basis to make sure it's updated too. But security awareness, uh, be proactive in your house and just make sure that uh, you are catching all those devices. Because to your point, there's several uh, IoT devices in the house, et cetera, that we just, maybe just don't think about. And uh, it's you know, we just have to be proactive and make sure we check on those every once in a while. You know, Max, it makes me think there's a certain family member that I have that likes to forward me emails that say, is this a scam? And I'm like, please don't forward those to me. <laughs> I've got the trains and I'll take a picture of it and send me a text of the picture. So, that wouldn't um, be your mom, would it, Carl? Because I'm not going to my, my, my biggest challenge is my aging loved ones. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, at least so on the consumer side, I mean, it's the same challenge, right? How do companies and banks, you know, make sure that their 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 customers are being safe so that they don't have to rebate refund the money because they did something, you know, bad? Yeah, I think this year uh, more than ever. I mean, we're in the middle of uh, the belly of the beast right now, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is our busiest time of the year. Um, I have gotten just as a, a plain Jane consumer, I've gotten more consumer focused security messages um, this year from companies that I do business with than I ever have in the past. So emails saying, you know, how to spot a scam, how to know that an email is really coming from us. And it's going way beyond financial services institutions. I mean, the other day I got an email from Target that had a big long list of security tips in it. Um, it wasn't that long ago, as a former CMO, I can say it's a, it wasn't that long ago where CMOs and VPs of marketing were really afraid of touching the topic of security at all because they thought it was a minefield and it was super negative and full of a lot of FUD. And why would I want all that fear and uncertainty and doubt associated with my brand as a consumer facing company? But um, I think I'm really pleased to see that those days seem to be coming to an end. Um, because, you know, for example, Target's email did not include any pictures of a hacker in a hoodie in it, which was really good. So all those tropes and cliches, they've, they've, they've done more harm than good, frankly, because our research shows that people are sort of worried and frustrated. And um, those emotions don't necessarily m maintain um, motivation for good, you know, behavior change, which is what we want to see from people. We want to see them enable MFA. We don't want to see them like freeze in fear and not do anything. So, um, so I think I think the message is a lot more of a dinner table mess, uh, uh, conversation now, and that's that's really what something that we advocate for. And I've been really happy to see that change this October. Because if you can't talk about cybersecurity with your customers during October, then I'm not sure when you can. Exactly. You know, we have a comment that was posted in the chat about you know frequent user awareness and training is needed, and we we touched on that, Max. You did, um, but it should be short, concise training. Do you agree with that? You know, how, how is that rolled out to to an employee base? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, if if it's too long, people aren't going to pay attention to it, right? And uh, and so for me, I 
I would, I appreciate more um, short, concise interactions on a recurring basis versus like one annual security awareness training, right? I, I like to keep it at top of mind. And, and um, for me, it's something that I would like to integrate more into even our own training program is, is like, you know, uh, a monthly brown bag, you know, email or something that just talks about a tidbit of the month or something that's trending, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There's ways to integrate, I think, security awareness uh, into uh, employee communications. That's not something that uh, they're going to be like, oh, gosh, here's another email from Max, right? There's ways to integrate things, I think, without making it overbearing on the employees or, or you know, smashing them in the face with it. Um, I, I think the more shorter, concise communications that have a good takeaway at the end of it is something that's going to be more impactful than a two hour training once a year that the employees are going to have to suffer fested through. Right. And um, making it more interactive, I think, and changing it up every year uh, is something also that helps. Um, you know, if you have it the same for three or four years, people are going to know what to expect and they're just going to click through it and then, you know, test out at the end and not pay attention to it. They're not going to have any takeaways from it. So, I think there's ways that we can keep it fresh and, and uh, new to the end user. Um, but also, uh, you know, I think security awareness, and, and I, I don't want to steal any of Lisa's thunder here, but taking some of those takeaways and then also passing it on to our family members, um, you know, specifically parents, et cetera, that maybe don't have some exposure to some of those uh, security awareness emails, et cetera, that come out, uh, I think are a good thing. Uh, for me, it's, it's especially the kids too. Um, you know, they're the ones that are out there on the websites, on the sites that they probably shouldn't. Uh, and, you know, they need to be more cyber aware than the rest of us that are really used to it, right? I mean, from a corporate perspective, we're getting several emails, several security awareness training opportunities uh, every year. And I think having the exposure to a lot of our family members that may not have exposure to that and passing that on to them is also something that we need to consider. Great. Yeah, we are. Oh, go ahead, Lisa, please. Well, we absolutely say that in our data, too. The, the, so we surveyed people age 18 all the way th through retirees. And people of working age um, definitely have different attitudes and, and a different level of knowledge about how to protect themselves compared to young people and older folks. So, so Gen Zs were the most likely to report that they have had a loss of data or money due to clicking on things. Um, those dollar amounts are very low. When you look at aging adults, um, they're less likely to click, but when they are defrauded, the dollar amounts are very, very high. So think about things like romance scams and uh, mortgage scams, things like that. So that data aligns with what the FBI sees as well. Um, unfortunately, Gen Zs are also a little bit um, fatalistic about the whole situation. Um, they feel like the horse is already out of the barn, the idea is already out there. Like they feel the lowest sense of personal agency, like that they can act, that what they do matters, that their own behavior online makes a difference in how secure they are. They feel the, they identify with that statement the least of any age group. Um, and they're also the least likely to say that they prioritize trying to stay safe uh, online. So they they have the highest propensity to click on things and the and the lowest <laughs> emotional commitment to think that they should be doing anything about it or that they can be effective. So we have a real opportunity with our kids right now um, and young people to to change that attitude because um, because that also doesn't make them very receptive to training if they feel like that it's not going to be effective anyway. That what they do uh, it doesn't affect that they can't have any control of their own safety online. Um, it's, it's a pretty dire situation when you look at the data. And I think somebody else came out with a report this morning that shows something very similar. Um, I'm a big fan of keeping training short and relevant. Not uh, There is a lot of training out there that actually talks down to users. Um, when's the last time somebody from the security team really sat down and went through your training themselves? Um, did they find it tedious or did they, did they find it interesting <laughs> and easy, easy to get through? I know some people working in training and awareness that will um, have longer training that, that, you know, if you're in a highly regulated industry like financial services, for example, maybe you have that mandatory training that everybody's got to suffer through, but then they make everything else that they offer to their audience for the rest of the year um, voluntary. So that means the content has to be valuable in and of itself. The um, employees have to perceive, hey, this is something that's going to help me. This might help my family. This might help me teach my kids to be safe online. So um, that kind of ups the ante when, when, when it's not all mandatory 
And you have to really appeal to people and you have to get eyeballs. You have to get their attention and hold their attention. Then you have to communicate at a whole different level. It can't just be that principle of authority, which is, you know, because the security team said so. It's actually got to be information that's useful and helpful to you. Yeah, and I think, you know, what also I found works, especially from an organizational perspective, is taking live incidents and obviously mm -hmm. not pointing out specific users, but also, you know, showing actual incidents that occurred within the organization, um, you know, and, and making it personal for the employees. Hey, this could also happen to me. And, and that also helps raise awareness. And I think it, it really um, works and makes it very unique for that company. Um, I've done that several times and I think it, I get very good feedback whenever I implement that into the yeah. training program. Yeah, no, good discussion on training. Thank you so much for the insights. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit, but it's related to AI. And I promised at the top of the call we would touch on AI <laughs> because it's, you know, ChatGPT made me do it. Um, but, but at the end of the day, AI is introducing tremendous opportunities into, into a corporate world or even consumer, improved efficiencies, enhanced capabilities. It's even a little bit of fun as well. Um, that we like to have. But of course, it's opening up new new vectors for bad actors to attack. And, and so, Max, you know, what's your advice on how to use AI safely in an organization? Yeah, well, and I think that's the key word there is, is using it safely. And, you know, I think there's several things that organizations can do to help protect their data and, and use Gen AI tools and capabilities in a manner that doesn't compromise your data. And uh, first and foremost, User awareness training. I know I'm, I'm definitely going to be repeating that on a, on a recurring basis, but I think there's several technical controls that are also going to help organizations protect data. Obviously, great uh, data labeling program, making sure that you have data labeling in place, and then backing that up with technical DLP controls. And you know, you see a lot of new tools coming out that are browser based, etc., that will help. Uh, prevent keywords or other things being input into uh, Gen AI tools. Um, and that's that's one way to go. Um, but there's also platforms that are implementing new capabilities out there um, for both inline and endpoint DLP uh, that will help you prevent, uh, you know, confidential or proprietary data being input into these tools. I think what organizations need to be really aware of is that there's other tools out there um, that leverage capabilities on the back end uh, that you may not know about. And uh, especially the, you know, the unsanctioned applications that maybe your GRC team hasn't done a risk analysis on or that your legal team doesn't have an agreement with. Those are the types of tools and capabilities and services that you really need to be aware of. So if you have the capability to go out and see what sites your employees are visiting, get the usage data and then um, do an analysis to see how you can protect your data from being input into those tools. And I know this is a huge uh, unanswered question, I think, for a lot of organizations, how do we have that balance of enablement, mm -hmm. business enablement, um, but also protecting the business? And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I've talked to several other CISOs that are battling that question right now. And it's a question that I'm battling as well. How do you how do you keep that balance? And uh, and so I think it's it's a combination of user awareness and, and implementing good DLP policies. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I talked to a uh, semiconductor manufacturer the other day and finding that balance is really, really hard for them. They're, they absolutely don't want to be the next Samsung. They don't want to lose their intellectual property. I think intellectual property loss is, is one of the biggest concerns, but at the same time, they, they want to make sure they still have a culture of innovation and that employees feel like, you know, they're, they can try things. Um, so it's it's really really nuanced and there's no single right answer i mean every organization has to do their own risk assessments and figure out mm -hmm. what makes the most sense for them yeah and you haven't even touched on the regulatory aspect of it which is coming right you're, you're <laughs> it, up, it is you're up a little further ahead but it's coming in the us and then you got the data privacy components of ai which you know what information mm -hmm. you're putting out there it never comes back you know never comes back and any thoughts max on the regulatory aspect of ai or just security in general yeah, well, I mean, you know, the regulatory environment for cybersecurity is just going to get more stringent, I think, as we, as we move forward. Um, you know, th the White House has been pretty clear about making sure that cybersecurity is at the top of their list. And, um, you know, in the most recent um, cybersecurity policy, you know, there's, there's a lot of accountability written into that. And I think the implementation piece of that is going to be very telling on the direction that we move. 
uh, you already see on the government side when you're talking about uh, contractors who work with the government, they're already under some very stringent cybersecurity controls. But to be honest, I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, um, it really forces companies to look at cybersecurity as a priority versus something that's a cost center, something that is of value. And I think once you once you get into that regulatory environment and you see a lot of that makes sense. Um, yes, it is a burden. Yes, it is an additional cost in a lot of ways. But it's also when you're looking at, say, federal government, it's, you know, you're protecting a lot of that data and it's data that could be critical to national security and or uh, other companies that are working for the government. Um, you know, take Optiv, for example. A lot of our customers and a lot of our deliverables are, you um, you know, network diagrams, vulnerability data. I mean, it's a lot of data that is critical to the security of the companies that we work with. And I think there should be controls in place to make sure that we protect that data. Um, so the regulatory environment, um, I think privacy is, is gonna continue to be uh, something that organizations struggle with. Um, you know, it seems as though several different states are coming out with privacy laws every year. And, you know, they're slightly different in, in different ways. Um, so I think that's just going to continue to be a struggle for organizations. But it's one of those things that we need to get on top of because it's going to continue to become more stringent and it's going to continue to be um, a more fractured approach, I think, as we look at different states uh, implementing different laws. I, I agree with Max that it's, it's, it's not going to get um, easier, right? It's going to get more and more complex. A lot of lar large organizations, instead of trying to comply with every different state, they're just going to pick what's most stringent and they're going to mm -hmm. comply with that across the board. So to me, that argues for more federal action in that direction, mm -hmm. because that's that's effectively what's going to happen anyway. I mean, that's what's going to unfold practically for a lot of organizations, because it's just not worth the time and effort to try and decipher what applies to what customer and what, what state. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was doing some research lately for a talk I'm going to give at the end of the month, um, and I was comparing the auto industry to what's been happening in, with technology in the information age and software development. And the, one of the things I found really interesting was the number of manufacturers who yelled and screamed that they're going to go out of business if we mandate seatbelts. <laughs> and we look back <laughs> on that now, and we laugh. But I think we're going to look back on probably this last decade or last 20 years that we've lived through of, of data breaches and bad things happening online. Um, and we're going to say, wow, what were we thinking at the time? You know, I, I think we're eventually going to get there. Um, we're, we're still in, you know, it's hard because we're just, you know, as humans, we just look at our lifetimes and what's been happening in our lifetimes, or maybe just our adult years mm -hmm. that we've been paying attention. Um, but if you look a little at, at the bigger picture, we're still really in the in the infancy of the information age, and there's still so much further to go to to see um, to see this whole industry mature. Um, I was sitting on a plane last year uh, next to somebody who was one of the um, he was one of the uh, uh, inventors of what turned into. Um, uh, uh, intrusion detection, and it wasn't designed to to be intrusion de detection in the beginning, I don't think. And he retired extremely early, got out of the game, and went and did yoga and, and, and things for the next 50 <laughs> years of his life. And he said, so so back me up, like, people are using the internet to do bad things, like, because I've just kind of gotten away from technology since, since you know, we literally had just kind of like checked out of society, including technology for the last 30 years or so. So, um, yeah, there's just been a lot of stuff that has happened that nobody could foresee, or maybe very few people or few, few people with influence could foresee. And I think we'll get to a I mean, we're, if I look at it compared to the auto industry, we've got consumer sentiment right now where consumers are asking for more protection. They're asking for more security by design, security by default. They don't want this to fall on their shoulders. Um, we've got a little more, I won't say regulation yet, but we've got a, um, a more, uh, some regulation and just and more uh, of a priority from the, from the government, like you talked about, Max. Um, and then, you know, I think we're seeing more and more security people that are starting to sound like Ralph Nader, right? That we're like trying to wave a flag and say, hey, we, we got a problem here. This can't keep going the way this is. So um, we'll, I'm optimistic that we'll get there. So uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, so I want to give you each a moment just to share 30 seconds, you know, 
what does cybersecurity awareness mean to you, you know, 20 years later? Uh, so Max, we'll start with you. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, you think about 20 years ago, what, what were you doing on your computer 20 years ago, right? And I, I was thinking of this, I, I think I just got ISDN changed over from dial up. Mm -hmm. And to use the phone while you're on the internet at the same time was groundbreaking, right? And I think That's you right. had antivirus and that was about it. I mean, you know, your home router was just your modem, that was it. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's an interesting transition to the tech that we're using now. And I think, you know, to Lisa's point, we are still in its infancy, but look at the, you know, the, the leaps and bounds of progress that we've had in the past 20 years. And so, you know, cybersecurity has evolved to the threat. And I think with AI, the one thing that, we just need to understand is AI is is not bad. It can be used for good too. And I think in this case, we're going to continue to see AI trend as we integrate it into other security products and fight fire with fire. And you almost have to. And I think for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, the takeaways that I would say is, you know, just make sure you, you use strong, complex, unique passwords, use a password manager, right? Implement MFA and just make sure that you educate your family members uh, and your friends as well on good cybersecurity hygiene and practices. And um, and those are the biggest takeaways I can I can say for cybersecurity awareness it's, month. Thank you. It's absolutely good hygiene. It's do the basics well. It doesn't have to be complex, especially for people like my kids and my mom. So there's four behaviors that we focus on this October along with CISA. And it's just like you mentioned, Max, it's MFA, passwords, phishing, and updates. Um, and if you do the basics well, those four things well, um, you're going to be in really good shape. Lisa, thank you very much, Max. Uh, both of you, wonderful conversation. We covered a lot of great topics and uh, some of it's pretty, you know, basic stuff, but it's the basics that are pretty important. Yep. So, um, you know, really appreciate exactly. it. And I love the fact that we covered it both from a consumer and an enterprise perspective. I think that was great. So I uh, want to also thank our viewers uh, for joining Optiv and this uh, for this Cybersecurity Awareness Month LinkedIn Live. If you're interested in learning more about cybersecurity resources, best practices, and tips, you can connect uh, with Optiv at optiv.com, as well as the National Cybersecurity Alliance at staysafeonline.org. And with that, we'll close out for today's call. Thank you very much. Thank, yeah, thank you. you.